Thank you. Please be seated. Dr. DeMarte, please take the stand. Council approach, please. Let's bring in the jury. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may continue. And ma'am, we left talking about the three scales of the MMPI on the clinical portion that, uh, that you reviewed, correct? Correct, the top two and three. And then you gave us, uh, before lunch, you gave us your impression, if you, not your impression, but, but your opinion about what those meant, right? Before yes. we left. Uh, are you familiar with the term floating um, profiles? Yes. And as it apply, is it have anything to do with the MMPI? Yes. What is that? A floating profile is when you see that there are a number of elevations, such as I described earlier, on the MMPI. When the vast majority of the clinical scales are elevated, again, that threshold is 65. When it's elevated above 65, it's called a floating profile. And how, why is that significant in this case as it applies to the defendant? A floating profile is commonly seen in individuals who have borderline personality disorder. Right. Um, you also indicated that you administered the WACE uh, test. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, why did you administer the WACE? When I first started reviewing the records, there was indication in those records that there was a sense of immaturity that was present. Um, for example, in Ms. Arias's booking profile, her the way that she took the picture, she kind of smiled as though it was a high school photo rather than a booking pi picture that you would typically see. This to me was, uh, was strange. I found it to be strange and immature. Uh, there was also the uh, things that happened surrounding that that suggested that there was, again, some immaturity there, such as her parents had indicated that she was described as being happy as hell when they came to visit her in jail. There was behaviors like this that were, that were aberrant, that were strange, and it made, me, it made me wonder whether there was some sort of intellectual deficit there that could be contributing to this, which is why I gave the intelligence test. And you were able to determine and find what you found, what you've already told us, correct? Correct. Um, as a result of that and in in the testing that you did, did you reach a diagnosis or, or did you have an opinion at that point or did you do more testing? I conducted the four tests that we've already discussed. And after that, did you have an opinion as to what the diagnosis was in this case? After looking at that, taking in consideration her behavioral observations and all of the different um, pieces of information that I had, yes, I did. And what was that? I diagnosed her on access to as borderline personality disorder. What does that mean? Generally, borderline personality disorder, you can think of it similar to what we see in teenagers often. This sense of immaturity and emotional, what's called emotional lability, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But generally, it's about instability. There's in, unstable interpersonal relationships, unstable emotions, and an unstable sense of identity, meaning who am I as a person? There's this constant fluctuation. There's a lot of manipulation that's involved with people who have borderline personality disorder and a large sense of immaturity. You can, again, think about a, a, a teenager. Um, one of the um, items that's been talked about is the DSM-4 um, and TR. Do you know what the DSM is? Yes. What is it? It's a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is information that we use to conclude on diagnoses. It gives us specific symptoms that are present to suggest the presence of a psychological disorder. Are you familiar why there is the TR version and what that means? The TR version is the updated version of the DSM-4. Is it the same thing as the DSM-4 or is it something different? It's not completely different. They are similar. In terms of criteria for various disorders, the vast majority of the criteria state the same. What's different is the subsections of every disorder. For example, a subsection in there might be, how do you differentiate X disorder from Y disorder? What are the features that we look for that tell us that it's one versus the other? So that's an example of one of the sections that was updated, such as adding additional diagnoses that say, 
you know, these two disorders might be confused with one another. Here's something that you consider to differentiate. One of the things that we've looked at with regard to post-traumatic stress disorder is that there was a number of sections and a number of characteristics uh, under each of the sections. Is the same true for borderline uh, personality disorder under the DSM-4? It's not laid out exactly like PTSD in that there's um, just a list of symptoms rather than categories like it is with, the, with PTSD. And with your, but, but it does have some characteristics. Though. That's correct, symptoms. Let me go ahead and have something marked. <clears throat> Are you familiar with Exhibit 622? Yeah, look at it. Yes, this is a copy of the DSM. And this is a copy of the DSM-4 involving what? This is the DSM-4 TR involving um, the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. If I may have that back. Does it also include the diagnostic criteria? Yes. And do you know those off the top of your head, or will this refresh your recollection as to what the diagnostic criteria is? I know them off the top of my head, but I think it would be helpful to have it. Right. Go ahead and take a look at uh, 6.2. And <coughs> let me ask you about it. Once you reviewed it, uh, what is the first criteria uh, that... DSM-4 lists for a finding or a diagnosis of a borderline personality disorder. It's called frantic efforts well, to avoid... Without, without reading it. If you need to okay, read it, sure. read it now. I need to read it. Okay. What, what's the first one in that? Efforts to avoid... Judge, real... we have the... Overhead. Efforts to avoid oh, real or there. imagined... Abandonment. What is it again? Efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. So that's the first one. Efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, correct? Correct. And in this particular case, what did you find as it applied to that? In the case of Miss Arias, I found that this was a symptom that was characteristic of her. Why is that? Explain to me how you found that. First, let me explain fears of abandonment. As, as humans, we all, we don't want to be alone. That's part of human nature. What we find in people who have borderline personality disorder is that they have a very strong desire to be attached and to be close to people. They have a, a terrified feeling of being abandoned by others. So what we see when I'm looking for symptoms of, if I, when I'm looking for signs of the symptom, I'm looking again for a, for a pattern, a pattern that has happened over time. In terms of this, what we see in people with borderline personality disorder is that they engage in behaviors to try to keep people close to them. But ironically, these kinds of behaviors often push people away. So in the case of Miss Arias, this was demonstrated throughout her relationship, well, throughout life. And also with um, Mr. Alexander. For example, after they broke up, when they broke off their relationship, she then moved to Mesa to be closer to him. I also interviewed his um, brother, Steve, and he indicated to me that Mr. Alexander... Without telling us what he said, what characteristic did you find? This fear of abandonment. Okay. This tendency to overstep boundaries, to be intrusive. Miss Arias herself notified me that she had um, checked his Facebook without his permission, read text messages without his permission, engaging in these kinds of behaviors of don't leave me, let me see what you're doing, I, I want you to be near me. There was indication from friends that highlighted her tendency to engage, engage in these intrusive behaviors by spying on him, um, uh, by being intrusive with his space in general. Okay, and so did she meet, meet this characteristic or yes. this criteria? What is the, you need to take a look at the exhibit, what's the second criteria? Unstable and intense interpersonal relationships. What are we talking about there? People with borderline personality disorder have a very difficult time maintaining what we would consider healthy interpersonal relationships. What they do is they have this tendency to 
split people, meaning that they have a tendency to either idealize them on one hand or devalue them and despise them. And what I mean by that, idealize means that, that they put this person up on a pedestal and nothing that they do, no matter what, they view them as being perfect. Whereas devalue and despise, they, no matter what they do, they dislike them, they're upset with them. And what we see with individuals with borderline personality disorder is that they tend to shift between these two types of interacting with people. So give us some examples, if, you, if there are any, involving uh, the defendant. I did find that Ms. Arias met diagnostic, met the symptom for borderline personality disorder. She had a very strong tendency to go from boyfriend to boyfriend, one after another, which is also another example of um, fear of abandonment that I just highlighted. What I found is in these relationships, there was a very strong tendency to idealize the men that she was with. For example, she had indicated to me that uh, Mr. Alexander was not faithful to her during the relationship, but nonetheless, she still had this devout love for him. And you can see within, even within her journals, the way that she talks about her boyfriends and her partners in general, it has this very adolescent, immature, for lack of a better word, a saccharine kind of feel to it, a very strong, sweet, wanting to make them happy feel to it, doing anything possible, keeping them idealized despite what was going on in their relationship. How about the next uh, characteristic? The next characteristic is identity disturbance. What is that? Again, I'd like to relate back to thinking of a teenager. When, um, when we're young, we all develop a sense of who we are as a person, and that can shift when we're younger. That can shift um, in many different ways. But what we find as we grow through adulthood that that becomes much more stable. We have a good sense of who we are as a person, what our beliefs are, um, uh, how we engage with the world. It becomes relatively consistent. You have an idea of who you are. What we see in people with borderline personality disorder is that that sense of identity is not there. It's not stable. It's changing. It tends to change depending on who's in their environment. And this is also a symptom that I found in Miss Arias. You can see this in uh, her tendency to join uh, the Mormon church really quickly. You can also see this in the records when um, her ex-boyfriend, Daryl, was talking about her be pattern of behaviors. He had indicated that at one point she... He had indicated that there was a, a point in which she had changed the color of her hair, bought a certain car, and acted a certain way to be consistent with his um, ex-wife. Again, this tendency to shift who she is. She had indicated to me that when she was with one boyfriend, she behaved one way, whereas with other boyfriends, she behaved a very different way, lived a very different lifestyle. For, give me an example of that. For example, with um, her boyfriend, Matt, she had indicated that at one point they were living in a tent versus when she was with Daryl, she attempted to be much more mature when she was around Daryl and professional when she was around Mr. Alexander. It's this constant shifting in who she is dependent on who's in her environment. And how about uh, the next characteristic? Impulsivity. What does that refer to? The tendency to do things on a whim, to not be thoughtful about your actions and be impulsive. This is not a symptom characteristic that I found to be a stable characteristic in this area. So in other words, this is not something that you found as part, on her part then? Right. I do not believe she meets this symptom. All right. How about the next one? Suicidal behavior. Did you say pseudo? Suicidal. Oh, suicidal. Behavior and ideation. I think that's um, self-explanatory. Tell us whether or not the defendant had any suicidal behavior and whether or not she had any ideation about that. It's self-explanatory in some ways, in other ways it's not. You can see suicidal behavior in a number of different psychological disorders. The way in which it fits into the pattern that we see with borderline personality disorder is, that, again, you're looking for a, a consistent pattern throughout life. I fortunately had access to Ms. Arias' diary, um, and throughout her diary, um, beginning in 1995, there was a consistent there was consistent notations about the desire to not be alive, to engage in suicidal behavior, thoughts about it. And, and so did she meet this criteria? Yes, because there was that pattern, she did meet that criteria. 
What's the next criteria? It's called affective instability. What is it? Affective? Affective instability. And I did not hear the next words. Instability. Okay. What is this referring to? The easiest way to think about this symptom is a roller coaster of emotions. Um, affective instability is when your emotions go up and down, up and down at a very qu a quick pace, unpredictably, up and down. And this is often referred to when people be show the symptom, um, most people will refer to it as the person has bipolar disorder, which is not an accurate representation of what bipolar disorder actually is, but it's just a quick shifting of emotions. And does she meet this? Yes, there was consistent evidence in, in the records of her tendency to go up and down. Several of her boyfriends um, described her, in fact all of them, of the information that I have had access to, they all described her as having very quick shifting emotions, going from happy to mad to sad very quickly. And, and interestingly, I saw that myself within her journal entries. Within the same day, I could see a person who was very happy to shifting to be very upset, very sad, and within one day, very quickly. Anything else under this uh, section? It, Not this section, but the one involving the characteristics. Anything else? Well, one more thing related sure. to affective instability, again, because I am looking for a pattern of symptoms over time. Um, there was indication that her parents had described this uh, as being a consistent behavior for her since she was relatively young. All right. Next. Chronic feelings of emptiness. I'm sorry? Feelings of emptiness. And how many of these characteristics are laid out in the DSM-4? How many symptoms? Symptoms. There's nine symptoms. And of the nine, how many must be met before this diagnosis uh, is viable? Five. Okay. Feelings of emptiness. Tell me about that. We find that people who have borderline personality disorder tend to have this prolonged sense of just feeling empty, just feeling like there's nothing there, despite the fact that there's all this emotional turmoil that does go on inside, they have this sense of just being empty. And I specifically uh, asked Ms. Arias about that, who indicated that she's felt that way since adolescence, just this sense of emptiness. Next symptoms. Inappropriate, intense anger. Okay. What is that? It's a tendency to engage in angry and aggressive behaviors. Uh, again, we're looking for patterns of behavior. And did you find anything in her writings where she admitted that she uh, had this inappropriate intense anger? <clears throat> yes, she identified it in an email to Mr. Alexander. I'm going to show you an exhibit. Take a look at uh, exhibit 623, see if you recognize it. Yes. And what's the date of that email? It's February 14th, 2007. And who is it from? It's from Miss Arias. To whom? Mr. Alexander. And does it discuss her inappropriate, intense anger? It does. Move for the admission of Exhibit 623. Yes. Yeah. Continue. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, you indicated there was nine, I think, symptoms that uh, indicated or that uh, may be explored when deciding whether or not something is borderline personality disorder. That's correct. Can we? Have... What's the ninth one? Transient stress-related paranoid ideation. Transient stress-related paranoid ideation. What is that? What that means is in times of extreme stress, we see high levels of paranoia. And did you find this in this particular case? No. Well, do you agree or disagree with uh, Dr. Samuels that uh, the defendant uh, may be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder? I disagree with that diagnosis. Tell me why you disagree with that. There wasn't symptoms that were consistent with that diagnosis. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. There were not symptoms that Ms. Arias displayed that would be consistent with that diagnosis. All right. Let's wait for that. I'd also like to clarify 
No, there's, there's no question. Does it relate to what you have in front of you involving borderline personality disorder? Yes. Let me take a look at it. Which section are you referring to? Referring to symptom number two. I'd like to offer an example. Pardon? I'd like to offer an example so the court is more clear. And this issue involving inappropriate intense anger. What does it say? If you could read that out loud, please. What part of it would you like me to read? Pardon? What part of it would you like me to read? The second paragraph. From the beginning. Beginning with however. However, you already know the secret. I don't need to remind you, but you are so powerful and you can turn the situation around at any time. I found out, much to my regret, that my anger is very destructive. Oh, slow down a little bit. The court reporter said that hard time. Sorry. Get up I've never beaten up anybody over it, but I've kicked holes in the walls, kicked down doors, smashed windows, broken things. It hurts people, and it hurts me. Keep going. The whole paragraph. It lowers my vibration and attracts unwanted lower vibrational situations and people into my life. So I strive every day to be the bigger person and be a living example and choose the right and see everything through a filter of love. But it doesn't always work that way. I mess up. Sometimes I forget who I am. But I will never stop striving to be Christ-like as much as I possibly can. Is that part of the inappropriate, intense anger that you were talking about? Yes, that's one example. And this actually was written by the defendant, Exhibit 623, on what date? That was on February 14, 2007. At what time? 1658. And 1658 is what time in 24 hours? Do you know what that I is? I would assume it's 4 o'clock. Well, wouldn't it be 458? 458, I'm sorry. If it's 4.58, uh, are you familiar with the story involving the defendant and the fact that did you and she discussed her receiving some candy or some underwear or something from uh, Mr. Alexander in, on February 14th of 2007? Yes, that she received underwear. And on that, it's the same day, right? Yes. If it's the same day and she's writing these things, if she's received these items and is now writing this, does that impact, or does that affect, or does it in, is it included in one of these uh, symptoms that you, we've just talked about involving person, borderline personality disorder? Can you clarify? Well, specifically, she's just supposedly is a gift from what you know. Is it a gift, a good thing or a bad thing? A positive thing. And then we're talking about what here? Positive or negative things? Negative. And so is that something that you see with regard to um, perhaps unstable and intense interpersonal relationships? Or is that not any part of this borderline personality disorder issue? I would say that I can't make that relation without more information. Okay. We were about to talk about... Uh, whether or not you agreed with Dr. Samuels about uh, wh whether or not this was post-traumatic stress disorder, correct? Correct. And you indicated that you disagreed, correct? Correct. In terms of this case, um, did you uh, prepare a report? I did. And with regard to the preparation of the report, how is it that you go about preparing it? I understand that you have to prepare the the content, but, but who, in, in your office, who does the typing? I do. And who does the reviewing of the report? I do. And so any errors that are there, whose errors are those? They're mine. And in this case, with regard to um, Dr. Samuels, are you familiar with, and I'll show you, 
exhibit number 544, with his conclusion and diagnosis that the defendant, um, according to him, falls clearly under criteria A1, A2, B3, C3, C6, and D3 for post-traumatic stress disorder. Are you familiar with that? Yes. If, a, if an individual is making that assessment, does that fall short under either C or D for post-traumatic stress disorder? Objection is characterized as Dr. Samuel's testimony. Overall, to me, answer. According to this, it does fall short. And where does it fall short? Which section? In the number of criteria. And the criteria are under A, B, C, or D? It falls short in D, and I'd have to review C to ensure that it falls fall short. You indicated that you've reviewed this case and that you disagree that this is post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I want to talk about your disagreement with Dr. Samuels as to why you, you believe that this is not a case of post-traumatic stress disorder. So how does that work in terms of the DSM? and how you go about making that determination. Can you tell me how that works generally? Sure. There are three primary, well, four categories of symptoms that we look for that suggest the presence of PTSD. And in these four categories, do you know off the top of your head, for example, what the first category deals with? It's just the presence of whether the person experienced a traumatic event, that they experienced a strong sense of fear, helplessness, horror as a result of it. How about the second, if you will, uh, general category? What does that talk about? The second category pertains to the tendency to re-experience symptoms. Okay, and the, and the third one, which would be the C, what does that one refer to? That's referred to as avoidance. And what does that mean? The tendency to avoid stimuli, thoughts, anything related to the trauma. And number four? The last one is termed increased arousal. There's a number of symptoms that fall under that. And what does it mean to have increased arousal as it applies to this particular um, section of the DSM-4 and PTSD? It's a change of arousal. For example, a, a new, newly dis developed tendency to become angry or the tendency to be hypervigilant, which means to be hypersensitive to your environment, looking around, making sure that you're safe, having an exaggerated startle response. If someone walks in the room, your body might jolt in a way that it typically doesn't. Those are some examples. Under A, if you can tell us again, because you went a little bit quickly on it, uh, what it refers to and whether or not you agree or disagree with uh, Dr. Samuels as to whether or not the defendant meets that criteria. A is the presence of a traumatic event that, so, go ahead. that causes a strong sense of horror, fear. So do you agree or disagree with Dr. Samuels as to that, whether or not the defendant meets it? Dr. Samuels indicated that, he, that she experienced PTSD as a result of the killing. And so um, do you agree or disagree with his assessment there? The way that she describes it, she felt fear for her life. So she would meet criteria for A. Yes. Well, what about the fact that perhaps there was these two intruders that came in? If these two intruders came in and there's this event, is that the basis for this meeting this criteria? If that's what he based his diagnosis on, then that would be inaccurate. And would you then agree that that that's, and if you can't meet the first criteria, in other words, if you are basing it, let's assume that uh, it's a, an event that may or may not have occurred. If it's an event that didn't occur, would that automatically do away with post-traumatic stress disorder? Objection is characterized as Dr. Samuel's testimony. Overruled, the jury is directed to recall the testimony presented during the trial. Would that do that? As I, yes, because as I highlighted earlier, the symptoms are strongly related to the actual trauma, which is that criteria A that you're referring to. So if there is no trauma, let's assume in, th in this case, if there are no two intruders that came in, hence no trauma, would that then um, speak against the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder? Correct. What was your answer? Correct. So does there have to be 
an actual event that triggers this, or can it, or can this post-traumatic stress disorder be based on a made-up event? It cannot be based on a made-up event. Um, one of the things that you also indicated was that Dr. Karp also found that there was post-traumatic stress disorder, right? That's correct. And with regard to her post-traumatic stress disorder, what was, what was or what were the triggering events? She indicated that Mysterious developed PTSD as a result of the physical abuse that she allegedly endured from Mr. Alexander. And let's assume that there was no physical abuse. Would that then, in terms of finding post-traumatic stress disorder, would that indicate that yes, the diagnosis was appropriate or not if those events did not occur? Similar to before, if the event is not true, then the subsequent criteria wouldn't apply. But if the event involved, you said that if the event involved the killing, and if that's what Dr. Samuels based it on, even though we have this PDS issue, then you would agree with him that it is, it could be an event that triggers um, this reaction. I would agree that it would meet the criteria for A. What about B? What, what, what is that again? What are we talking about with regard to B? What is the uh, overall subject of that? B is re-experiencing the tendency to think about and relive the experience, the traumatic event. So what we're talking about with regard to this one is we're talking about re-experiencing, correct? Yes. And on this one, I'll give you exhibit number 545. Please take a look at it. Let me know how many symptoms there are there and how many must be met. There are five symptoms that are listed here. And how many must be met? One or more. So it's one of five, correct? Yes. All right. Make if I may have the back once you looked at it. What is the first symptom that we're talking about with regard to this re-experiencing? And that would be B, correct? That yes, would be the B, B, yes. What is the first symptom? I would have to reference back. Right. I know the category as a whole that I could speak about. Why don't you just keep this up here? Okay. Let me know when you are referring to it. Okay. So what is the first one? Recurrent and intrusive distressing recollections. What was the first word again? Recurrent. Uh-huh. And intrusive distressing recollections. And re recurrent and Distress. intrusive? Recurrent and intrusive distressing recollections. Tell me about that. What does that refer to? What we see as this symptom is that thoughts about the trauma keep invading their mind, essentially. Right. It creeps in constantly, where it, it causes intense distress inside of them. It bothers them. They're thinking about it a lot. And does the defendant meet this criteria? There's indication that she thought about it, but not to the level that we see in people with PTSD. What, what do you mean? It, it sounds like uh, you're saying, yeah, she thought about it, but no, she didn't. Why don't, why don't you explain to me what you mean? So in any kind of negative event, it's, it's not uncommon for people to think about it. That's very different from a developing into PTSD. For example, some of my own patients, they're so bothered by their thoughts of whatever traumatic event that they experience that it causes difficulty for them to engage in day-to-day -day behaviors and activities. And did the defendant manifest this to you at all during the clinical interview? No. How about in her journals, for example, um, did any of those journals indicate that she had this recurrent and intrusive depressive recollection? Distressing. I'm sorry, no. distressing recollection. She did not? No. Okay, what is the next item? Recurrent distressing dreams of the event. Dist 
uh, recurrent distressing dreams of the event, right? Correct. And it seems self-explanatory, but tell me about it. They're having nightmares and dreams about what happened. And Frequently, did, recurrent. And did the defendant report any of this to you? She indicated that she had some dreams about it, but not recurrent. And uh, her journals, did they, or any writings that you saw, do they any indicate that she had these uh, recurrent dreams uh, of the uh, event? No. Next. Acting or feeling if the traumatic event. I'm sorry, acting or feeling? If the traumatic event. If the, tra if the traumatic event. <coughs> were reoccurring. Okay. What's going on here? What this symptom is, is reliving it. You can see, typically in people with PTSD, they may just be sitting there and all of a sudden start reenacting it. They're reliving the actual traumatic episode. So in this case, if we're talking about the killing of Mr. Alexander as the triggering event, that's what we would expect to see her carrying it out. Yes. And any indication anywhere that, that she has had any of this acting or feeling or, 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 or carrying out this event? No. What is the next one? Intense psychological distress at exposure. Pardon? There's more. Oh, okay. At exposure to cues. Just giving you the shortened version. All right. So what are you talking about, or what is it talking about there? When there's cues of the trauma, so in this case, the killing, anything related to Travis, talking about him, um, symbols, signs that remind Miss Arias of him would cause that internal psychological distress, the feeling of uneasiness and strong emotions related to it. When it says intense, is that a sort of quantification, if you will, of the distress, or is that something else? When you say intense, what is intense? Strong. Mean? And uh, did you see any of that here? No. Did you discuss this issue of the, what may have been involved with her and Mr. Alexander, with the defendant? Yes. And did you see any of this intense distress when you spoke with her about it? No, and she was putting herself in situations to be exposed to that. When, when you say she was putting herself in situations to be exposed to that, what are you talking about? She was writing about him in her journal, um, attending memorial services. Okay, so if she's attending the memorial services, what does that indicate to you in terms of this intense psychological distress? That she's able to cope with it, that there's cues that she's walking towards and that she's able to psychologically handle that. And are you talking about the memorial in Mesa? That's one example, yes. Okay, next. Physiological reactivity to cues of the traumatic event. Of traumatic event? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, what is that? What physiological reactivity is, is a visceral response, a beating of the heart, feeling a very strong physical response to exposure. Any indication of anything that you've read that shows that on the part of the defendant, that she has this physiological reactivity to the traumatic event? The only thing that I read that would be related to this is uh, there was a note from her attorney that indicated that... Well, other than that... Do you have anything else? No. So does she meet these items here? No. Let's talk about Section C. And what does Section C refer to? Avoidance. And how many symptoms are there to choose from here? Seven. And how many of those must be met in order to meet this criteria? Three or more. Right. What's the first one? Efforts to avoid thoughts, feelings, and conversations associate, associated with the trauma.
All right, what do you know about that? Similar to the stuff that I highlighted before, um, she was writing about it quite a bit. In her journals? She, so in, her, in her journals. And how about attending the... Judge Foundation writing what? Sustained. When you're talking about, let's be more specific, you indicated that she was writing in her journal. What is she writing in her journals that it does that indicates that uh, she's not attempting to avoid thoughts, feelings, or conversations associated with the trauma? She was writing a lot about Mr. Alexander and, and talking saying, about him. Was she sa saying good or bad things? She was saying good things. And uh, this was, again, after the trauma or after the killing? Yes. What else? What's the next? Efforts to avoid activities, places, or people. Or people, is that it? Associated with the trauma. These are all associated with the trauma. All right. Tell me about this and whether or not she meets, meets this criteria. She does not meet this criteria. Tell me why and specifically give me the examples as to why you think she does not meet this criteria. She went to his memorial service. She wrote a letter to his family. Um, she was surrounding herself. How about with, sending 20 irises to his grandmother? Is that part of that too? That would be another variable that I would... What else? Anything else other than what you just said? Again, writing about him, talking to uh, mutual friends. All right. So does she meet that criteria? In other words, do you see her engaging in efforts to avoid the activities, places, or the people associated with the trauma? She was not putting effort to avoid him. Next. Inability to recall an important aspect of the trauma. Tell me about that. When people are exposed to traumatic events, uh, most people have an acute memory of what the traumatic, traumatic event is. But there are times when there are traumatic events that they lose aspects of what happened. And is this something that the defendant manifested? She's reporting to have lost a significant amount of time associated with the killing. So does she... Just based on her statements alone, does she meet, meet this criteria? Purely based on her report of it alone. So with this one, yes. would you say yes or no that she meets that criteria? Based on my knowledge of how memories typically form or surrounding traumatic events, I would not agree that she meets this criteria. Based on her report of it, yes. So, but based on your um, schooling and experience, you do not believe that she meets these, this, right? That's correct. Tell me why. Well, related to traumatic memories specifically, as I highlighted earlier, when people experience a traumatic event, it's not like our day-to-day -day event, events that we have. It's hard to remember what we ate for breakfast a week ago or what we wore. That's different with traumatic events. When they occur, they tend to stand out in our mind more, which is part of why we see the development of some disorders that we see. But there are times that people can become hypervigilant and focused on only aspects of the memory, which causes memory loss. The reason why I don't believe that to be the case with Miss Arias is because of the way that she is reporting the memory loss is not consistent with what you typically see. First of all, tell us what she is reporting that you found important. She indicated to me that she had a very large gap in her memory. And were we, by large gap, how, are we talking um, minutes? What are we talking about? She told me that she had a several hour gap. So we're talking about a several hour gap. Why is that significant to you? That's not how it typically presents with traumatic memories. Expl explain to me how it is that it works with, with that, a traumatic event and, and the memory issue. They tend to lose aspects 
of the incident, small aspects of the incident. The only time that you see that there's those large aspects that are missing, potentially for several hours, is if there's a severe head injury. For example, I had a patient who had blood coming out of his ear one time as a result of a traumatic um, incident, or if there's any kind of substance abuse that's involved. But you don't see that long of duration. And there's other inconsistencies with her report. All right, so the inability to report, one of them is that it's too long of a gap. Too, the, the time is too long, right? That's one problem. What's the other problem, or the other problems as you see it? What we see with traumatic memories is the more that that people talk about them, we see that they tend to gain memory about it. And that's a big part of what we do in treatment. They, get, they tend to gain stuff that they thought that they had lost. What I found with Ms. Arias is that is not the pattern that she displayed. What is the pattern that she displayed as to whether or not she recalled items uh, that she didn't previously recall? If I go back to what she reported to me, she had indicated to me at the time of the killing that she went to go and grab the knife. And then her memory from there was almost completely absent, with the exception of the potential memory that she might have put the knife in the dishwasher. Aside from that, it was completely absent until the point that she hit the Hoover Dam. Yep. In terms of what she reported to Dr. Samuels, who I had access to his report, he had indicated to her that... He, or she indicated to him. Um, I apologize. She indicated to him that she disposed of the weapons and changed her clothing, is what it indicated in his report. The reason why this is important to me is because I saw Miss Arias after Dr. Samuels. If you remember the way I just described it, when, pe when we see true memory loss, the more that people talk about it, and Miss Arias has talked about it quite a bit in interviews and with different evaluators, you see an increase of memories, even if it's just a little bit of an increase of memories, usually it's, it's significant. And in this case, I met with her after Dr. Samuels, so it's showing the opposite pattern that you see in typical traumatic memory. Anything else? Or Related to memory? Yes, uh-huh. Or are those the reasons that, in your the, mind, indicate that she did not meet the inability to recall an important aspect of the trauma? First of all, I, the length, and then second of all, the, the issue involving her failure to remember as she went along. I would say that there's another aspect. And what is that? What Ms. Arias reported to me was that when she reached the Hoover Dam, she looked down at her hands and saw a little bit of blood. And I asked for clarification of that. Was there blood all over? Was there just a little bit of blood? She said, there was a little blood on my hand. She said, I knew this meant that I killed him. And I asked her, how do you know that that meant you killed him if you have no memory? She said, I knew I did. So that to me, tell, that's impossible, it's illogical. Well, why is that impossible? It's illogical because if all of a sudden a person had blood on their hands and had no memory of the events that just happened, you wouldn't think, I just killed someone. You might think, I cut my finger, what happened? Not, I killed somebody. Right, so that would be, she does not meet that one. What is the next uh, item underneath avoidance? Markedly diminished interest. Okay, what, are, what does that refer to? What that symptom is, is it's called what we call a psychologist anhedonia. It's a loss of interest and pleasure in activities. What we see in individuals is that they stop engaging with the world. They stop um, doing the activities that they enjoyed. And with Miss Arias, she continued to engage with people. There was indication in her journal that she was spending time with friends. Um, she had indicated to me that she had an interest in um, pursuing school. And there, there was no indication that there was this anhedonia that was present. What about the fact that shortly, within a day of uh, killing Mr. Alexander, she finds herself making out with somebody by the name of Brian Burns? Is that indi you know, contra indicated to this markedly diminished interest or not? That is a symptom of what I highlighted earlier of borderline personality disorder. So that, that, that is not have anything to do with this markedly diminished no. interest. What, what does that have to do, this involving Mr. Burns, what does that have to do or how does that fit in with your diagnosis of borderline personality disorder? 
I highlighted earlier that people with this disorder tend to have the tendency to either idealize or devalue people. So what you see in this situation is Miss Arias just engaged in a killing and was able to then go and have a, a romantic encounter with an individual shortly after. What that suggests is there, there a flip occurred. Earlier I talked about how there's a flip between idealizing and devaluing. To be able to go and engage in the way that she did uh, and not have any uh, sort of external cues that it was problematic suggests that she was at that point of devaluing someone, despising. And next, what is the next item? Feeling of detachment or estrangement from others. Or estrangement, did you say? Correct. Okay, what is that? Similar to what I highlighted earlier, feeling like you're you can't be around people, you're not part of the crowd, staying away from people, you feel a sense of uh, being separated, estranged from them. And does she meet, meet this or not? No. Why not? Because of the th things that I highlighted earlier. So tell me what they are. Related to her activities afterwards, related to her engaging in uh, social activities with friends, with her uh, going again to the memorial and meeting up with people that she was familiar with. All right. She her, her um, tendency, she was going to go camping at one point. And so, again, she does not meet that, correct? Correct. Next? Restricted range of affect. Restricted range of affect? Is correct. That <sighs> and what is that? You think of it as having a blunted level of affect, essentially shortening um, the amount of emotion that you can have. So someone may not be able to have feelings of love during that time, um, not be able to have any kind of drastic emotions or experiences. And this was, again, if we go back to her journal, she was talking in there about how much she loves Mr. Alexander after the killing, um, there was no indication that there, this was a symptom that represented her. And last is what? Sense of foreshortened future. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Sense of foresh foreshortened future. Sense of foreshortened future? Yes. Okay, what is that? Individuals with PTSD often have a time seeing what their future is going to be like. They're so caught up in the emotional turmoil that they're experiencing as a result of the trauma that they tend to talk about themselves as nothing outside of that trauma. So contrary to that, they're, they're not talking about dating, courting other men, um, what their career will look like. And these are things that I saw in this area. Specifically, what are you talking about that you did see in the defendant? Well, in her, her journal entry, she spoke about courting other men. Any, anything else? How about her job? Did she have a job? She did have a job. So, so far, we've seen that B and C are not met. Does that mean at this point that this is not um, a diagnose, diagnosis of PTSD that is appropriate? That's correct. But let's talk about D and tell us about... It's increased arousal is the general category. The first one is difficulty falling or staying asleep. And how many of these are there? There are five. And how many do you have to meet? Two. Okay, difficulty falling or staying asleep. Did you talk to the defendant about that? We did talk about sleep. And what did she say? She indicated when she first got to jail that she had difficulty sleeping, but it was because of the loud noises that were in the jail. So doesn't that sort of seem to fall in, under this category if she's having difficulty falling asleep because of the noise in the jail or not? 
No, we're looking to remember at the etiology of it. Where did this come from? What is this a result of? And again, we, I'm going to try and link this back to the actual trauma. In this case, it does not meet criteria because it's not associated with the trauma. So it's not associated with any trauma is what you're saying. Right. It's a change in environment. Next. Irritability or outburst of anger. Okay. Does she meet this? Consistent with what I highlighted before, that this is much more of a personality pattern that we see with her. Any symptom that would be suggestive of PTSD, we would expect that the symptom emerged only after they were exposed to the trauma, not as a pattern throughout their life. So no, there, she does not seem to meet the symptom. And going against that is Exhibit 623, where she talks about these adverse of anger, correct? That's correct. Next. Difficulty concentrating. I think we know what that means. Why don't you tell us what, what it means to you? The ability to maintain and sustain attention. Um, there was indication by Ms. Arias that concentration was an area that she has struggled with, uh, with the tendency to be uh, clumsy, was also highlighted in the records. Um, again, we're looking for symptoms that would occur after the traumatic event. This does not seem to be a new symptom for Ms. Arias. All right. So she doesn't meet that either, then? That's correct. And number four of the five? Hypervigilance. What is that? I explained earlier that hypervigilance is a tendency to be really hyper aware of your environment, to know what's going on around. And this is a protective measure. When you're exposed to a traumatic event, your body gets heightened. So you look around, make sure you're safe. And I was, I was fortunate enough to um, have videos of Miss Arias shortly after the killing um, in the video that she participated in related to 48 hours and her police videos where I would be able to observe that symptom if it was present. And was it present in those videos that you observed? It was not present. And finally, number five under this category is what? Exaggerated startle response. Exaggerated, what was it again? Startle. Oh, startle response. What are we talking about there? The tendency to get startled very easily and also, like it says, exaggerated. So instead of just maybe a quick little jerk that someone may have if they hear a noise, we would see um, an exaggerated kind of jerk. So it's a startle response. And did you see this uh, with regard to the defendant? No, and again, I was, I was lucky enough to have the records that I did in that it showed me her behavior shortly after. And there were times in the video where doors were slamming and there were noise that uh, I would expect to see that kind of symptom. And did you see that? No. So based on this um, assessment, do you agree or disagree uh, with Dr. Samuels as to the post-traumatic stress disorder. She does not have post-traumatic stress disorder. How about with regard to Dr. Karp? Do you agree with her assessment that this was PTSD due to this pattern, if you will, of abuse? No. Are you familiar with the term or with the, um, yeah, the term adjustment disorder? Yes, I am. What is that? Ad adjustment disorder is... Uh, refers it's a psychological disorder that refers to a change in behavior as a result of something that happens in someone's environment essentially it's um uh, in the case of Miss Arias um I did diagnose her with a so this is something that you looked at in addition to this uh, borderline personality disorder that's correct do you know whether or not Ms. Dr. Samuels addressed this issue in his report he did not give her this diagnosis. And he, did, he didn't indicate either way with regard to that, correct? Correct. Ma'am, are you familiar with the issue involving the defendant's, or are you familiar with memory issues as they apply in this particular case? Yes. Tell me about the memory issues that are involved in this case that, as you know them. As I highlighted earlier, she indicated that she has a very large memory gap of the night of the killing. Well, are you familiar with the fight or 
reflect issue as it applies to memory. Yes. Uh, tell me about, first of all, what fight or flight is, and then we'll talk about the memory issue. Sure. Fight or flight is a response. It's a fear response that occurs in a situation where there's some sort of stimulus that is causing fear. In that situation, our body essentially prepares to protect itself. So the way that it prepares to protect itself is that our, our, our blood flows to those places that are going to help us protect yourself, like our muscle groups, to be able to run fast enough. Our body sweats so that um, from an evolutionary perspective, if the tiger bites onto us, it'll slide off easier. Our body essentially prepares to protect ourselves. And how is memory affected? during these fight or flight situations. It becomes secondary because our body is trying to protect ourselves. And so what happens in terms of whether or not a person can remember or not remember what's going on? So during these times, what we there are times that people have memory gaps. And during these times, we see that behaviorally, they act very different um, in that because there's parts of their brain that are losing access to the typical blood flow that it would have, we see that different areas of the brain don't act in the same way that it does. For example, our frontal lobe is what helps dictate our ability to organize, our ability to plan, all these kind of higher order functions that we do as humans that, for example, we wouldn't expect a dog to be able to do, organize, planful behavior. When someone's in a fight or flight mode, we don't see those kinds of behaviors. They're completely just trying to run and protect themselves or fight. You don't see any of that other kind of higher, what we call higher order behaviors. And did you see any higher order behaviors here that speak against the fight or flight memory loss issue? Objection, Judge Newby, first. Yes. Overruled. With regard to this issue about fight or flight and uh, this issue about uh, the memory afterwards, in terms of the memory, and I'm just talking about the memory afterwards, uh, elements that of what happened after the killing that indicate to you that this was not a felony, not a felony, but a, a, a fight or flight circumstance. There was indication to me that this was not fight or flight. Why, why is that? And, and be specific about it. Related to? After the killing, correct. Related Anything to behavior? having to do after the killing, not before the killing. During the killing. Judge, perhaps we could take a break now. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take the afternoon recess. Please be back in the designated area at 315. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Please back to the jury. Record will show the jury has left the courtroom. You may step down. Counsel anything before the break? No. We have recess.